Hey guys, welcome back to Momentum. I hope you guys are grouping up with your friends tonight and listening to the message together. And uh, I hope this season has been a time where you've been able to think and reflect on what God is doing in your life. And, uh, and so tonight we have a powerful word from Pastor Jeremy. And so listen in. What comes to your mind when you think of growth? Now, what's the word? Don't think too hard about it. Just what comes to your mind when you think about something growing? Uh, some of you might say health. Some of you might think bigger, better. Uh, some of you might think maturity. Like, what do you think? What's the word that comes to your mind? Go ahead, say it out. If you're with a group right now, what's the word when you think of growth? And that's what I want to talk to you about today is, is growth and just kind of the, uh, the other side of it that we probably don't pay as much attention to. And I want to frame it like this. I mean, I want to talk to you today about growth, but I really want to talk to you about diapers and dentists. That's how you're going to remember this. Diapers and dentists. We're coming up to the halfway point of the year here pretty soon. July 1st is going to be halfway through 2020. And I don't know about you, but I feel like I just started April, like yesterday. And we're, we're moving towards June right now. What is happening? Uh, so we're coming up to the halfway point, And I'm looking back on all my resolutions right now that I set on January 1st. I've got them right here in front of me. And I'm just going to be honest, I pretty much suck at all these things. Like I have not done them very faithfully. Like I'm supposed to be in the best shape of my life, the best financial fitness of my life, supposed to be healthier, all these things. And yeah, uh, you know, I could blame it on Corona. I could blame it on quarantine. But the truth is, is I just kind of let growth get away from me. I, I let, I took my eyes off the ball in terms of what it means to really grow. And so I want to take a look at the scriptures today at a, a passage, at actually, I mean, really an overview of the book of Nehemiah. And that doesn't get a lot of airtime. People aren't really reading the book of Nehemiah too often. It's not one that contains lots of miracles. There's no stories of Jesus in this thing. There's nothing here that, that really speaks of just great spiritual growth. In fact, it's kind of a, a, a quiet point in terms of what's happening here in the Bible. Nehemiah is right before we enter this period called the intertestamental period where God is actually silent. There's no miracles. There's no recorded visions of, of God telling his people what to do. This is just a story of hard work. This is a story of a guy getting after it in a season where it just seems like God is silent, where there's not really some kind of spiritual wonder in front of him. He's just got some work to do. And so to kind of set this up for you, this story of growth, this story of vision, I want to tell you a little bit about what's happening here in the book of Nehemiah. I mean, this is right after the, the, the kingdom has been split. So Judah has been split. There's Babylonian exile that's happened. And after Babylon moved in, right after that, Persia comes in and it pretty much scatters the people of God. And so these two warring nations come in, they split the people of God, the People really have no home. Judah is no longer what it once was. People don't have ancestors or family members that they can lean into. I mean, picture it's like instantly you're orphaned. Instantly you don't have that support network. And so that's where we pick up is just this people of God have been scattered right in the middle of this exile. And we meet this guy, his name's Nehemiah. He's working for a king at the time. This is like fast forwarding 90 years now. We meet Nehemiah and he's the cupbearer. He doesn't exactly have like a super glamorous job, but he works at the right hand of the king. And what we get to read here is kind of his journal on what life is like at the time and how he responds to difficulty. Now check this out. This is what it says, Nehemiah chapter one. It says in late autumn, this is Nehemiah. This is his journal here we're reading. In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, that's like November or December, our time. In the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. Then Hannah, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who'd just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who'd returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. So Hannah arrives. He's like, hey, what's going on, man? How's everything happening back home? Tell me a little bit about it. Nehemiah may have never even visited this place. He may have never even been to see like his old hometown or where his people come from, but he's curious. He genuinely wants to know how things are going. And so the text goes on and it just says this. It says that Hannah responded to him, things are not going well for those who returned to the province of Judah. In fact, they're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Now check this out. And this is what I want to hone in on today. 
Nehemiah says, when I heard this, I sat down and I wept. In fact, for days I mourned, I fasted, and I prayed to the God of heaven. So in other words, this wasn't just news for him. This got personal really fast. Like he heard about all these things that are happening back home, all these things that are happening back in this hometown of his, this place where he comes from. And instead of turning a blind eye to it, he thinks to himself, man, this is something that matters. This is something that, that is stirring my heart up here. And so he gets all emotional here. And it says in the text, it says that when I heard this, I sat down and I wept. In fact, for days I mourned, I fasted, I prayed, and I called out to the God of heaven. And I said, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Would you listen to my prayer? Look down and see me praying day and night for your people, Israel. There's a lot happening around us right now too, right? A lot happening in our world all around us. And this has just reminded me of a question. Instead of looking at my list of resolutions of things I need to grow in and things I need to change and you know, make more money, lose more weight, put on more muscle. I mean, those are great little goals. Those aren't dreams though, man. Those are attainable, easy things if I just get more disciplined. But I just kind of asking myself here, like what, what do I need God's help on? And, and more important than that, what is it that the world needs from me right now? You drill down on this question, it's simply this, like, what breaks your heart? What is it that, that breaks your heart listening here tonight? Like if you're in Nehemiah's shoes and you hear near news about something that stirs up emotion in you, what is it? What breaks your heart these days? What is it that lays a fire underneath you and gets you to one, where you wanna work and you wanna do and you wanna change and you wanna fix? What is it? Like what breaks your heart, honestly? Like reading this story of Nehemiah here, he doesn't look around and think, okay, well, you know, somebody else can handle this Jerusalem situation. Hannah, it's been nice talking to you, but you know, you, you can go on and handle it yourself. Instead, he says, man, what should be done around me here? What is it that I need to fix? What is it that I need to change? How can I contribute? My heart is aching for this people and I wanna do something about it here. I love the way that he responds as the text goes on. I mean, it's pretty clear that this is not something that's just a, a, a check on his to-do list, but there's such an emotional response. You can tell he genuinely cares about it. And I'm wondering tonight for you, student, maybe you're gathered up in a group, maybe you're watching this alone right now, but what is it, honestly, that truly breaks your heart for the kingdom of God? Listen to Nehemiah's confession here. He says, I confess that we've sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We've sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. He's understanding here that this falls on him as well. He says, please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you're unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you're exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I've chosen for my name to be honored. Nehemiah recognizes that he's got a part to play in this. Now, student, let me drive this home like really quick. Like when I look around, there's some specific things to my story that when I see it, I think to myself, man, I gotta change this. I gotta fix this. I gotta act on this. When I see somebody that comes from a broken home, the way that I did growing up, my heart aches for them. I wanna legitimately help them in their walk with God and understanding what it means to truly know God as father. Now, maybe you've gone through something that uniquely informs your story, like where you can speak into somebody's life in a way that nobody else could because you've got a unique experience with it. Your heart was broken at some point along the way and it's given you an opportunity to minister now. Like Nehemiah understands he's got a part to play in this thing. And instead of pushing it off, I love this so much, man. Instead of pushing it off and just saying, somebody else is gonna handle this. Somebody else is gonna deal with Hannah's problems. Somebody else can rebuild the wall in Jerusalem. Instead of all that, he assumes responsibility and says, I've got something to do here. I'm not gonna blame another person. I'm not gonna push it off on somebody else. Like my favorite with us right now, teenagers, my favorite thing with y'all is the way that you guys just blame other people. You point the finger at somebody else. Like if you've got a failing grade in English or something, I never hear, yeah, honestly, you know, I, I just should have worked harder. I'm not very good at English. 
You know, what I hear is, yeah, my teacher, she doesn't know how to teach. Like she needs to go back and get her degree. She wasn't paying attention. She doesn't even know how to teach English. My math teacher doesn't even know math. She's terrible. Like you're always passing the buck on somebody else. And I just want you to examine your own life for a second and just ask yourself, who am I blaming? Like what situation in my life am I blaming for me not taking steps in order to impact the world? I mean, I've said it before to our Forney students, but people who blame things never change things. I mean, blame is, is no kind of recipe for change. That's a recipe to keep things exactly the same. If you want things in your life to look exactly like they do right now, keep blaming somebody else. I mean, that's a, that's a fact here. You want things to remain unchanged, continue to blame somebody else. And instead of doing that, Nehemiah wises up and he says, okay, this may not be my fault. This may not be my responsibility technically, but my heart is broken for my people and I feel like I should do something about it. What breaks your heart, teenager? Who are you blaming that's causing you to not step forward in maturity? And look at the way that Nehemiah steps up here. He says, the people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. Oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayer of those who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. So he's saying, I'm gonna go before the king, God, and I'm gonna request to go back and begin construction on the wall in Jerusalem. He wises up. He's like, I've got a part in this to play. I've got to grow up here. There's another step that I need to take. And you know, I'm wondering for you, like, I mean, what are ways that you're not growing up right now? Like you can't stay in diapers forever, right? I got, I got three kids. I got Emery, Zeke, and Titus. And thank God, two out of the three are out of diapers. It would be a problem if my seven-year-old right now was like, dad, uh, potty training, I'm out on that. I want to wear the diaper. It's the same way with you, like junior hires, high schoolers. Can you imagine if you're like, eh, you know, potty training, not my thing. I kind of just want to rock the diaper. It might be funny for a second, but after that, it's like, dude, this guy smells terrible. This guy looks ridiculous. You can't wear the diaper. You got to grow up. And I'm talking in a spiritual sense right now. You can't stay in diapers. There's another step that you've got to take here that you've got to start trusting God on. And Nehemiah closes out this chapter with a really telling line. And in our last three minutes, I just kind of want to unpack this here. But he just says this, in those days, I was the king's cupbearer. And he ends with that. Kind of like he's writing the last entry in his journal and he just says, in those days, I was the king's cupbearer. And that's kind of his way of saying, in those days, I was comfortable. In those days, I had life figured out. In those days, I had the stable job. That was kind of my previous life. And now I've got to grow up. Now God's got something more for me here. I took Emery to the, the dentist here uh, a little less than a year ago and they discovered that one of her teeth had begun to rot. And uh, she begged us not to take it out. She begged us not to have it pulled. She begged us not to allow the dentist to cut that open. It was gonna cause her a great deal of pain, but there was something that, that needed to happen in terms of her growth. You understand, this, this might blow your mind for a second, but we like to think of growth in terms of addition, like growing bigger, better, healthier, you know, there, there being more, that's our idea of growth. But I wanna submit something else to you is I actually wanna think of growth as a necessary ending. Like there's some things in your life that need to be removed. There's some things in your life that, that need to be pulled out, like a rotting tooth. And so we took her to the dentist and she begged us and she begged us. And when she finally sat down in that chair, they, put the, they gave her the gas, they gave her the numbing medicine, they yanked that tooth out finally. On the other end of it, on the other end of the pain, on the other end of the fear, on the other end of the, the unwillingness to change, was growth and relief and thankfulness. It was a necessary ending. And I would hope that tonight would begin something in your life, teenager, where you can look back and say, oh, in those days, I was this. Oh, in those days, I was that. But now, now I've experienced growth and now I've experienced change. What necessary endings need to take place in your life, teenager? What needs to change? What needs to be removed? But most importantly, what breaks your heart? Let me pray for us. Father God, right now we come before you and we're just thankful. God, you, you are the God of addition. You are the God of growth, but 
God, you are also the God of subtraction and removal and removing these things from our life in order to bring about sanctification and holiness. Now, Lord Jesus, tonight, we ask just for that, that you would grow us. And if that means removing certain things, God, help us do it. Jesus, we wanna trust you even with our necessary endings. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Hey, tonight, if you made a spiritual decision that could look like a variety of things, if you just wanna talk to us maybe about a next step in your relationship with God, we'd love to talk to you more about it. If you would simply just text the word response to 888-111, you can get in touch with us and we'd love to hear a little bit about your story and tell you a little bit about how you can take some next steps in your relationship with Jesus. We love you guys. We're gonna catch you same time next week. I'm rooting for you, Forney Campus, in our uh, Clash of Campus competition. I hope you guys are killing it out there. Have a great week. We love y'all.